The video you are about to see was created in collaboration with the Interfaith Center of New York. In this video, local religious leaders explain some of the most important beliefs and practices of their respective faith communities. Police officers in New York encounter people from a wide range of religious backgrounds. The department is dedicated to protecting religious liberty, both recognizing diverse faiths and respecting their beliefs. Our first priority is keeping the public and officers safe. A working knowledge of religious diversity will help us do that effectively. Our success in combating crime and protecting human life depends on working with the communities we serve while treating everyone we encounter with dignity and respect. This video offers suggestions for interacting with members of diverse faith communities. Police officers' actions are guided by the law, but they should also be guided by an understanding of people's customs and beliefs. Working as partners with the faith communities who call our city home, we can ensure that New York City remains the safest big city in the nation. New York City has always been blessed by its vibrant religious diversity. The city's countless faith communities generally live together in peace, but like all New Yorkers, they rely on the New York City Police Department to guarantee their safety, liberty, and security. We spoke with local religious leaders about their beliefs and traditions and their experiences working with the NYPD. In this brief video, we cannot explore all of the religious practices you may encounter while on patrol, so we have focused in part on faith communities that may be less well known or misunderstood by other New Yorkers. We hope a richer understanding of the city's religious life will help you work effectively with the diverse New Yorkers you protect and serve. Religious leaders play a very important role in police and community relations. We're called to be the bridge builders, the one that's sort of like the mediator between community and the police. We're called to create harmony wherever we are even in the midst of the most intense situations out there. New York is such a great city with many different communities that it's even uh, more important today than it was ever before for everyone to know what kind of communities exist in New York, who the people are, what do they stand for, uh, and their basic principles. Every New Yorker has their own sense of personal style, but in some cases, you can learn a great deal about an individual's religious faith and identity by paying attention to their dress and physical appearance. Like with any faith community for Muslims, you might not always be able to tell that you're interacting with a Muslim simply by looking at them. Muslims in New York are Arab, they're African immigrants, they're African American, they're Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Albanian, Turkish extremely diverse, look diverse, diverse skin colors, diverse ways of dressing. Islam is a faith tradition and a way of life, rooted in the teaching of the Quran and the moral example of the Prophet Muhammad. The tradition was first brought to New York by enslaved African Muslims in the 17th century. Today, following the growth of the African American Muslim community, as well as immigration from throughout the Muslim world, some 600 to 800,000 Muslim New Yorkers worship at nearly 300 mosques throughout the city. There is a very important you know, aspect in Islam. As a man, he shows his obedience to Almighty God by growing a beard. For women in particular, they will wear loose garments, long sleeve, long skirts, long pants. And they may also choose to cover their hair wearing a hijab. They may also choose to cover their face wearing a niqab. Women are asked to cover themselves with modest dress when they're interacting with males who are not their relatives. Buddhism is an ethical and spiritual tradition that has no single definition of religious identity or membership. Some 150 to 200,000 New Yorkers, mostly but not entirely in the city's rapidly growing Asian communities, would describe themselves as Buddhists and participate in temple life. Many more, however, are guided or inspired by Buddhist thought and practice. For me, a little bit of research is very important uh, because in the Buddhist tradition also, there are many different countries in Asia and they speak all different languages. 
you know, Chinese, but even like a Mandarin, you know, Cantonese different, Korean language different, Japanese language different, and Tibetan language different, Sri Lankans, everybody sort of speak different languages. There are many different Buddhist traditions we have, but one of the common core is uh, this emphasis of awareness or so-called enlightenment. Sikhism is a religious tradition rooted in the teachings of Guru Nanak and his successors, who built an independent faith community in the Punjab region of South Asia beginning in the 15th century. There are approximately 50,000 Sikhs in New York City, including a large population in Richmond Hill, Queens. The vast majority are Punjabi immigrants and their families. So one of the things that is important to know about Sikhism is that it's the fifth largest religion in the world. There are 23 million people worldwide. We've been in, in the United States for over 100 years, so we are in every facet of society. In most situations, when you see an individual wearing a turban, and I would argue in 99% of those situations, when you see someone wearing a turban, that person is a Sikh. So this is the turban um, unfolded, so it is about 15 feet long and about two feet wide. An initiated Sikh wears the five articles of faith. We call them the five Ks. The Kesh, which is unshorn hair. Ganga, which is a wooden comb. Kara, which is the steel bangle. Kirpan, which is a mini sword, which is worn to think about defending people who cannot defend themselves or always doing the right thing. And then Kachera, which is an undergarment and it represents self-discipline. So going into a little bit more details about the Gurban, because people always have questions about the Gurban, and I'm sure the NYPD does as well. The Gurban is an article of faith, similar to a small knife. It is generally worn in a crossbody strap called the Gatra. It's very sturdy, it's very secure. New York has been a center of Jewish life since the 19th century, and its Jewish population now stands at nearly 1.1 million. The city's diverse Jewish communities include a broad spectrum of religious and secular identity and observance. This video will focus, however, on the rapidly growing Orthodox and Hasidic communities of Brooklyn. The symbols of Jews and, and what a religious observant Jew carries or wears is uh, very, very unique because you can have an observant Jew uh, not even carrying a yarmulke, but he's still an observant Jew. You can have the same observant Jew uh, carry uh, a host of, of different items. It's a lot according to tradition, what your grandfather used to wear hundreds of years ago. So you have different uh, prayer shawls and different uh, yarmulkes, your curls or payas. It's a sign that you don't forget your observant Jew, uh, you know, a son of God. It's a sign that you are living your life for God and doing God's work. Hinduism is often described as the world's oldest living religious tradition. The tradition was first brought to New York in the 1890s by the renowned Swami Vivekananda and is now practiced by some 250,000 New Yorkers, mostly but not entirely in the city's diverse Indian and Indo-Caribbean communities. Going back to 60s and 70s when there was a great influx of Hindus or Indians from India at that time, a lot of women were attacked because of the attire they wear, the sari, and also because of the bindi they were wearing. The bindi that we wear signifies that uh, we are Hindus. It also represents the third eye, the strength. And nowadays a lot of non-Hindus also wear because it's a beauty mark. <laughs> People have learned, have accepted, uh, but it has taken a heck of a long time. The Yoruba Lukumi tradition is part of a larger family of African diaspora religions that includes Haitian Vodou, Cuban, and Puerto Rican Santeria, more properly known as Regla de Ocha, and many others. These ancient faiths survived the Atlantic slave trade and are now practiced by tens of thousands of New Yorkers, primarily in the city's black and Latino communities. The Lukumi faith as practiced in New York City is a religion that has a central God figure, but has many, many, many different aspects of God uh, that are worshiped as 
called Orishas, and it is a nature-based religion. Right now, I think I look pretty mainstream, and I happen to have my elekes on, which have symbolic, religious, and spiritual meaning for me. All of our elekes, our sacred necklaces, are color-coded. These individual strands, each stands for an Orisha. Every house has a different pattern in the bead strand, but the colors tend to be pretty uniform. Because this is a popular religion now, uh, particularly among African Americans and Latinos, uh, there has been some, some other uh, groups like gangs have started buying beads that look like these and wearing them for their, their gang colors. The difference between them and us is that we have multiple beads. We're not wearing one set of, we're not wearing one strand. New Yorkers gather for prayer and fellowship in countless houses of worship throughout the city. NYPD officers are always welcome in these sacred spaces, but should approach them with care and respect and with an understanding of community norms. When you think about the different places that worship takes place in, it takes place in homes, in individual homes. It takes place in the wonderful cathedrals. It takes place in the storefront. It takes place on the street corner with a man with a Bible in his hand and a, uh, a little microphone. It takes place wherever there are people that will listen. That's church. Over five million New Yorkers are Christian, far more than all other faiths combined. But New York's change in Christian communities also reflect its growing diversity. Catholics from Mexico, Poland, the Philippines, and elsewhere have joined the city's historic Irish and Italian parishes, while evangelical and Pentecostal churches now thrive alongside more established Protestant denominations. Christianity for us is about community. It is about outreach. It is about the church without walls. And so God's, God's scripture, God's word for us says, for us to do justice, it says to love mercy, but to do justice. The most holiest place of Muslims is a mosque. But particularly in Friday prayer is a very uh, special day for Muslims, uh, especially in noon time. This is, we call it Salat al-Juma, or the Juma prayer, Friday prayer. Muslims can pray anywhere, and they can pray at home, they can pray in their office. They could put down their prayer mat on the street, on the sidewalk, and pray there. When you see someone praying, don't interrupt their prayer. Don't talk to them, and let them finish before you ask a question or ask them to do anything. A Gurdwara, which is our place of worship, is a very large hall and the scripture is usually in the front side of the Gurdwara. It is usually put on a platform, so we treat the, our scripture, the Guru Sahib, just as it was a living Guru. So when entering a Gurdwara, the police should know that to cover their head and remove their shoes. When the NYPD officer uh, you know, visit the Buddhist temple, there are certain manners that should be kept. Like when you, when the officer come to the like a temples or even somebody's house, if you see a little statue or shrine, you know it's just a simple respect is also always good to have. The officer shouldn't touch or should ask the family. If you start, you know, moving all those things, you really offend the family. Our faith tradition in New York City does not have a institutionalized structure that many of us might be familiar with. We practice in homes. We come together in homes. And our ritual practice is not quiet. There's no murmuring. It is very loud and boisterous. There are not a drum. There are drums. We are singing. We are dancing. So if you're walking past the street and you see a hundred people in white standing outside and then there's another hundred people inside, you're like, what is going on here? It looks like a party of, of people in white. But what is going on is a ritual. Religious rituals vary widely by faith, but many incorporate similar patterns of fasting, feasting, prayer, and celebration. These practices create a spiritual framework for individual and community life. In major rituals, major rituals, we will sacrifice, do an animal sacrifice, and then we uh, offer the sacrifices to the Orisha uh, in question, and later clean the animal, uh, cook the animal, and eat the animal. Officers need to know that uh, as long as the animal is being kept in a humane way according to New York State laws, 
the animal sacrifice is, is legitimate under state law. Muslims fast during the month of Ramadan from dawn to sunset and do not eat or drink anything during daylight hours, not even water. We have very long days, uh, thirst and hunger, all that is there and a little bit of tension. So in case uh, NYPD officers, they need to in, uh, talk to somebody for any reason. If it's not something very urgent, then it's much preferable to talk to him, you know, after, uh, after they break their fast. Friday night, um, an observant Jew would not uh, drive or carry any items, not even a cell phone uh, or identification. Uh, for the most part, you can see a lot of observant Jews walk Friday night very late at night, and it's because they're coming home from either services or um, meals with families. Uh, when the officer stops an individual and asks for identification, and the Orthodox Jew that observes Shabbos says, I don't have an ID on me, that's, that should be understood that that's the religious custom and he's not trying to be disrespectful, he's not trying to hide anything, but simply is observing the Sabbath. By understanding the role of religion in everyday life and interpersonal relations, you may avoid unnecessary confrontations while policing New York's faith communities especially in the event of a search or arrest. Without compromising public safety or security, it is important to acknowledge religious and cultural diversity. I say, always say two, two things that can make your job easier. Communication and um, common sense. Females would not uh, shake a, an officer's uh, male's hand because of religious guidelines and, uh, and that, that sometimes I can see an officer feel offended or feel disrespectful, but if he knows beforehand that this is what to expect, automatically he wouldn't take it as a disrespect, but would take it, oh, this is an observant person that uh, keeps their religious uh, beliefs. So one of the things that the police needs to know about the Sikh community is that newly immigrated Sikhs have faced a different mindset back in Punjab, back in India, where they have faced a lot of repression from the police. So there could be some bias in, among those individuals. If you're a male officer interacting with a member of the opposite sex, you'll want to keep the basic guideline of modesty in mind. If a person avoids looking you in the eye, know that actually it could signify respect and not evasion. Be respectful, especially when it comes to uh, a yarmulke or when a woman has a wig. Bring him in in private. Do it with a respectful way. A woman to take off a wig in public is probably the most violated uh, she would feel ever in, in her life and would take it as the, one of their biggest sins. Why would you want to have that mark on a person's life for the rest of the life? Asking a Sikh to remove an article of faith um, should always be a last resort. If at all possible, please find other means of searching them before asking them to remove an article of faith. If an officer sees someone, that officer should simply ask, are those beads sacred? And uh, what do they symbolize? Ask the question before touching. You wouldn't want to take a turban off a Sikh, you don't want to take a Lakeys off of uh, a Yoruba practitioner. So there's like a whole art form to this. This video has explored religious dress, sacred space, ritual practice, and everyday interaction in some of New York's many faith communities. Whether or not you are a person of faith, we hope you have seen the similarities and differences between your own beliefs and those of the diverse New Yorkers you protect and serve. We are very much participant in society. There are many law enforcement officers who are part of the tradition. We are neighbors and we help each other. I think if we develop that kind of relationship, the respect also goes higher, and then the level of protection also goes higher. And I think individual communities can benefit a whole lot if this kind of respect only intensifies. Public safety is not, just not, doesn't rest just with NYPD. It rests with me as a faith leader. It rests with the community as well. And I think with us working it together, then our light can truly come. NYPD officers, you have within you the power to change our city the way we know it. 
And it can simply be by a kind word, a smile, reaching out to help somebody on the street, humanizing yourself, not to the point of compromising your power, but to the point of using your power for the good of our city.